1 Corinthians 11. While you're making your way there, a couple of things for you really quickly. Please do help us out uh, with driveway safety. Lots of changes going on in the parking lot, obviously. Lots of people have been curious, asking us questions about the big hole. And if you're not careful, you're going to know so much about the big hole that you don't want to know. You'll be able to tell us all about it up close and personal eyewitness testimony, and we don't want that. So please do be careful as you make your way around the church campus. We want to thank Pastor Ruth and everybody who served at Fire in the Night. It was a great time in the Lord's presence Friday night into Saturday morning. Amen. As we wrapped up our 21-day fast, now don't try to make up for that fasting by eating two pounds of nachos tonight. Uh, during the Super Bowl, but if you did fast for the first time as a part of our church-wide fasting, then we do congratulate you. We want to encourage you to continue to make fasting a part of your regular spiritual discipline. It is such a great way uh, to seek the Lord and to really add some, some punch and some teeth to your praying. So we're believing the Lord for great things to come out of that time of fasting and the fire in the night service as well. Please also do keep Pastor Glenn and Brian Kelly in your prayers. They are ministering in the nation of Myanmar, uh, Burma, and pastor is going to be ministering there with Pastor Raymond Mui. Pastor Raymond has just received unusual favor from the government to be able to hold meetings there in the capital of Burma, and so we just want to pray the Lord's safety and pray for a great harvest of souls there throughout these next days. Also want to remind you that we'll be having our annual business report in the month of March, which is unbelievably coming up soon, and uh, we want to remind you that over the next couple of weekends, the 8th and the 5th, we're going to receive nominations for positions that are coming open on our church board of deacons and trustees. This year we are selecting two deacons and in your program today is a flyer that will give you a little information about qualifications for nominees. So I want to ask you to pray and uh, seek the Holy Spirit about who perhaps you might nominate. Let's ask the Lord to continue to give us uh, godly leadership and wise leadership at the church as he always has and we'll be taking nominations over the next couple of weeks, there will be a box in the back of the sanctuary that we can use for that purpose. We're also getting ready for our annual Good Friday worship celebration at the Palace Theater in Stanford. If you are newer to us, then every year I want you to know that every year uh, on Good Friday we rent out the Palace Theater in Stanford and we have a tremendous night of worship and outreach together. And we want to give you an opportunity to participate in the choir. There are going to be tryouts today after the third service, the last service of the day, or if you do need to go home quickly and make those nachos, uh, we're going to be here next weekend as well for tryouts. So right after the third service, um, they'll be ready for you. You can just pop up onto the stage when third service is done and quickly move into that. And finally, just before we look into the word, we want to ask you if you will pray for the families of Pastor Faith Batista and Hope Vespia. Uh, their mother, Mary Passero, passed away yesterday and we will be sending out information to you from the church concerning funeral arrangements. So please do keep in your prayers uh, Tom and Faith and Steve and Hope and their families uh, over these next few days. All right, let's look together into the word at uh, 1 Corinthians 11. And I'm going to begin reading at verse 17. Verse 17, Paul says, I do not praise you since you come together not for the better but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. For I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup 
of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. Here in this passage, the Apostle Paul is giving the church at Corinth correction and instruction concerning the Lord's Supper. And I want to share with you today on being a guest at the table of Jesus. Being a guest at the table of Jesus. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to minister among us as we look into the word of the Lord today. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us your holy word. It is a lamp for our feet and it is a light for our pathway. Jesus said that the word of God is like seed. So, Father, we open our hearts to you now in this time. We ask that our hearts might be good soil, soil that can receive and retain and bear fruit from the word of God. Jesus said the words that he speaks to us are spirit and life. So, Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and minister life to us now from the scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, we've been journeying as a congregation through Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. The Corinthian church, we've seen, was facing a number of problems and temptations, and so Paul wrote them a letter from heaven, a word of grace and guidance from the Holy Spirit, a message that would help them become more like Jesus. Paul delivered to the believers some timeless truths that are just as powerful to help us today, 20 centuries later. We've come to a section of 1 Corinthians in which Paul is answering some questions that the church had asked him. They had concerns about marriage and purity and what they could eat. And in these chapters, Paul has been pointing them to the great goal of living for Christ, living in order to gain an eternal crown. We don't want to waste any more of life pursuing temporary things or pursuing a temporary momentary glory. Last week, Pastor Glenn shared with us about working just to get some celery. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, then make sure you get that recording. I want to encourage you to get the CDs of any messages that you might have missed because of the recent weather. And you can listen to them also on our website, or you can actually watch them also on our YouTube channel. And as Paul moves now into chapters 10 and 11, he is becoming concerned again for the unity of the church. He will take his apostolic authority and correct them about how they have been abusing the Lord's Supper. He's going to remind them of its true purpose and why we share in it as we're going to share in it today. He's going to remind them that they are one body in Christ and that they need to act that way. Much of what Paul says in this passage doesn't make a lot of sense to us at first. Jesus' words about communion are certainly familiar, but the scenario that Paul describes doesn't really match up with the way that we do church nowadays. In order to understand what Paul is trying to say to the Corinthians and to us, we need a little bit of background about how they celebrated the Lord's Supper in the early church. In the ancient world, religious events often centered around a meal or a feast. Worshippers in ancient times didn't just pray or sacrifice to their God. They often ate together in honor of their God. For example, we know that the Jewish feast of Passover was a symbolic meal designed to tell and to retell the story of how God delivered his people from slavery. Passover was and is celebrated every year in order to remind the people of God's saving power and in order to pass those important truths down to the next generation. In the pagan cultures of the Roman Empire, religious meetings and meetings of business people and tradesmen 
often involved a common meal as well. These were often little better than orgies with drunkenness and prostitution. So as the church spread through the empire, it was moving into a world that already had established customs for social gatherings, uh, what people ate and how. We need to remember that there were very sharp lines of distinction in that world, very sharp lines that you did not cross. It was kind of like Downton Abbey, except with sandals and, uh, you know, robes instead of white tie and tails. There were lines of wealth and lines of class and lines of gender, and you simply did not cross them. And those distinctions also applied when it came to the dinner table as well. You know, for a good 200 years or more after Christ, believers did not meet in church buildings like we do here. Christians met in homes, both for worship and for social occasions. The most that might happen in the early church was that a wealthy person perhaps might knock out a wall in his house so that his house could accommodate more people. At the time that Paul wrote this letter, it would have been unusual for, say, more than 40 people at a time to meet for worship. There just wasn't any place to do it, at least not safely. You know, the emperor was not renting out the Colosseum for meetings for Christians. That's not usually how the Christians met in the Colosseum. Customs differed here and there, but believers often met for a double purpose. They would gather socially and then they would trans transition over later to a time of communion, sharing the Lord's Supper together. You know, the phrase food and fellowship was not invented by a church secretary one day typing up the bulletin. From the very beginning, believers have shared meals together as a way to strengthen the bonds of Christian friendship. And these gatherings were called love feasts. We've got a little drawing up there, a little mosaic from the ancient world of one of these feasts. Not sure you can see it in the brightness of the light. The Greek word for the love of God was agape. And so these feasts were called agape feasts. Sometimes the feast itself was just simply referred to as an agape. So we can imagine that we're in Corinth and we see a couple of Christian brothers bumping into each other on the street. And the first one might greet his friend and say, Marcus, it is good to see you, my brother. Are you coming to the agape tonight at Lydia's house? And Marcus might have said, oh, Julius, it is great to see you. Praise the Lord. I would really love to come, but remember, tonight is the Super Bowl of Kiss Maximus. And behold, I have placed a wager upon the Seattle birds of prey. <laughs> Things really haven't changed all that much in 2,000 years, have they? <clears throat> so there were different ways of doing it, but in Corinth, it seems that the Lord's Supper was eaten after the agape meal, after the food and fellowship. <clears throat> Excuse me. When we understand that, we understand that there's a difference between the fellowship meal and the Lord's Supper than what Paul is saying here and the problems that he's addressing in the church make a little bit more sense to us. Now, when it comes to the Lord's Supper, obviously we are quite a ways down the road from the time of Paul and a lot of tradition has accumulated concerning the Lord's Supper since Paul wrote these words to the Corinthians. And because of that, we should look within the scriptures to see a little bit about what the Lord's Supper is not before we can look at what Paul says about how we can enjoy being a guest at the table of Jesus. A first caution when we think about the Lord's Supper is to remember that it is not a Christian Passover or a replacement for Passover. Jesus' words are clear. The Lord's Supper commemorates the fact that Jesus has established a new covenant for us. The Bible does say that Christ is our Passover, but that means that Jesus has fulfilled the Passover. He has fulfilled its meaning. He is what the Passover was pointing to. Jesus was the Passover lamb, the lamb of God who takes away our sins. 
And the Lord's Supper is not a yearly meal like the Passover. Instead, Paul says, as often as you do it. So Paul was expecting, anticipating that Christians would receive the Lord's Supper often, regularly. A second thing to bear in mind is that the Lord's Supper does not involve a transformation of the elements into something else. Jesus said, this is my body. But Jesus said that while he was handing them the bread. In other words, Jesus was still alive in his body, not yet crucified, when he handed them the bread and said, this is my body. Church, there are not two copies of Jesus. There is no indication in the scriptures that the bread and wine are changed into Jesus' literal flesh and divinity. The meal of the Lord's Supper is a memorial, even though Jesus is certainly present in a powerful way to minister to us the many blessings that he purchased by the shedding of his blood. A final caution in thinking about the Lord's Supper is this. It is not a sacrifice for sins. Some believe that the bread must change into the literal flesh and divinity of Jesus because they believe that they need to repeat the sacrifice of the cross. But this is not biblical. First, there is no indication at all within the Bible that such a thing takes place. Second, such a sacrifice is not even necessary for Jesus died once. How many of you know that Jesus can never die again? Nor does he even need to be sacrificed again. The Bible is clear that the atoning death of Jesus was a final once and for all event. In Hebrews chapter 10, we read, Every priest stands ministering every day and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. To understand the finality of Jesus' death on your behalf, once and for all, means that you can know peace. To be confused about it is to always be in doubt about where you stand with God. The Bible says, Jesus made peace through the blood of his cross, not by having to be sacrificed over and over on a continual basis. When we look at Paul's words, we see that the Lord's Supper was not one of the things that the Corinthians had even asked him about. But what happened here was that Paul had heard a report about their behavior. Now, the report was a little bit one-sided. It was coming from the people who felt that they were being slighted by another group of people. So it was a little one-sided. Paul says, I've heard this report, and I partially believe it. But still, the truth of how the Corinthians were acting was so contrary to the gospel, and Paul felt it was so outrageous that he says, when you're meeting, you are not coming together for the better, you are coming together for the worse. In other words, he is saying what you're doing is so offensive that you would be better off not even having church together. What did the Corinthians do in order to grieve the Holy Spirit to that degree? Paul diagnoses their problem, and it was a dangerous condition. The church was suffering from spiritual amnesia. Communion is a word that means sharing something together with someone. And that's why in the English language, at any rate, we so often just simply refer to the Lord's Supper as communion. In chapter 10, it was a passage we did not read today, but Paul says that the cup of blessing which we bless is the communion or it is the sharing of the blood of Jesus. In other words, we share the cup together because the thing that unites us is that we all have a share in the same cup. In the same way, the bread that we break, Paul says, is the communion or it is the sharing of the body of Jesus. And we share the bread together for what unites us is that we all have a share in the same bread. Do you get what I'm saying here? In other words, when we say communion, let us not think so much about bread, 
let us think about the fact that communion means sharing and that we are all sharing in eating the same bread. But the Corinthians had spiritual amnesia. They had forgotten about that. They had forgotten the needs of their brothers. They had forgotten why Jesus had instituted the divine meal. And they had forgotten the powerful statement of unity that communion was supposed to make to the world. Now, Paul is going to cure their amnesia by taking them back to the beginning. He takes them all the way back to the night that Jesus instituted the meal with his first followers. And in Paul's words, I find four powerful calls to remember how to be a good guest at the table of Jesus. And I want to share them with you this morning before we ourselves partake of his table. Four things that the Corinthians needed to remember, and we should remember too. And the first one is this. Paul wants them to remember your brothers. Remember your brothers. I know, aren't they cute? In verse 18, Paul addresses the lack of unity that the Corinthians showed in their agape feasts and at the Lord's Supper. Paul says, for first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, divisions in the church. Those divisions were groupings among the believers, like we saw in the beginning of the letter, if you remember, when one person said, well, I'm a follower of Peter, and another person said, well, I follow Paul. But as we'll see, the divisions here in this chapter were not based on who's your favorite preacher, but they were based on social and economic status. In other words, who had money and who did not. This doesn't mean that the church had split into different groups. However, when the church met together, people were dividing. They were taking sides. And they showed that they were divided in the way that they met and worshiped and fellowshiped together. Church, here's your tweetable line of the day. Don't take sides. Look at his side. Look at his side that was opened for each of us for the blood that he shed for all of us. Because at the foot of the cross, we are all the same. Amen. Verse 19 is a little tricky. Paul says, <coughs> excuse me, there must also be factions, factions among you. Your Bible, thank you, your Bible may say heresies. There must also be factions among you so that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Now, this is something stronger than mere favoritism. Factions means that you are splitting the church by holding to false doctrine, by teaching false doctrines. And Paul says a kind of a mysterious thing. He says that these things must happen. They are bound to happen on occasion. Now, that doesn't mean that God wants it to happen that way, but it takes place because of the weakness and the pride of human nature. But Paul goes on to say that God even uses those factions, these heresies that arise for his own purpose. And he allows it to come to pass that the people who do hold to the truth can be recognized and people can see that God approves of them. And as we have rolled down the centuries of, of church history, we have seen that these words are correct. The church is still here. The church is still holding to the truth of God. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And yet we can see in history that in every age, some people claim to be believers even while they deny the truth of the word of God. Today, as well, we see people who claim to believe, who claim to belong to Jesus Christ, and yet they will teach you that men can marry men. Or they will teach you that Jesus Christ himself is just a mere man like you and I. Now in verses 20 through 22, Paul begins to get to the heart of what he's saying. And he challenges the rudeness of the wealthy people in Corinth. He says, so when you come together in one place, get this, he says, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one is taking his own supper ahead of others and one is hungry and get this, he says, another is drunk. What? Don't you have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? Paul says, you haven't really come together to eat the Lord's Supper. 
you are just taking opportunity in this gathering to display your own wealth. Or maybe you've just come to party. You've just come to enjoy a social occasion. In the ancient world, rich people ate better than the poor, even in a public setting. Imagine if you went to a restaurant where they handed you a, a different menu based on the size of your wallet. And, you know, maybe you were willing to pay more, but it said, well, we know that you're not one of the approved people in the city, so here's your lousy menu. <laughs> but that's what it was like in the ancient world. When rich people went to a feast, even if it was a public gathering, there wasn't one menu. The rich people got to eat first, they got better quality food, and they got bigger portions of it. This is well documented, and the pagan authors wrote about this, sometimes quite comically. And Paul is shocked because here's what was going on in Corinth. The rich people in the church carried this over into the church. They were doing exactly what the rich pagans did. They didn't wait for everyone. The poor people and slaves couldn't come to the meal earlier on time because they had to work. Neither did the rich help the poor to enjoy the evening. Instead, they embarrassed them by that behavior. They could have eaten at home if they were really hungry or... Uh, they could have contributed more money. They could have contributed better food to their brothers in Christ so as not to embarrass them. It seems that people were eating to excess, and Paul even says that people were drinking to excess. Can you imagine that it comes time to celebrate the table of the Lord and lots of people in the room are actually drunk? Well, as they say on TV, but wait, there's more. In the ancient world, rich people actually ate in a better, more comfortable part of the house when you went to somebody's house. Imagine going to a party where the rich people are all sitting on nice chairs and you know where you are. You're in the patio with those hard metal folding chairs, right? <laughs> the way these houses were designed, it's quite possible that the poor people, because of the layout of these houses, the poor people probably could not even see the rich people because they would have been in another area of the house. So Paul's disgusted by this. He says, when you come together, it certainly is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Paul wants them to know that they have missed one of the most important purposes of the Lord's Supper. And that is to demonstrate that you and I, whatever our different backgrounds, we have become one body in Jesus Christ. You know, around that table, there were supposed to be rich and poor together, Jew and Gentile together, slave and free together. That was something that was unheard of in the Roman world, and it actually was something that was disgusting to Roman society. Eating the same bread together was supposed to be a sign to that world of the beautiful unity that we possess in Jesus, but they were destroying it. In church, we don't do church that way, thank God. But we also dare not damage the unity of the body by bringing the divisions of the world, bringing the discrimination of the world into the church of Jesus. The rich people in Corinth were saying, well, I should go first. I should have more. I should have a better cut of meat. But prejudice destroys the church as one body. Paul is telling us to remember our brothers. The prejudice and the neglect of the poor that the Corinthians displayed was proof that they were not acting as worthy guests at Jesus' table. May we love one another in such a way that our relationships, that our fellowship, and that the table of the Lord that we share might show the world that we truly are one in Jesus. So the first thing we need to do is remember our brothers. The second thing to remember when we are invited to Jesus' table is this. Remember to examine yourself. We need to examine ourselves. Paul says in verse 27, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened. We are being chastened by the Lord 
so that we may not be condemned along with the world. <clears throat> you know, some of us in this room, I'm sure, were raised in a religious environment where we were taught to examine ourselves for any known sin before receiving communion. And I want to say that that is certainly not a bad idea at all. We should keep short books with the Lord. We should quickly confess any known sin to him, and we should try to make things right with people as quickly as we can. But you know, this is not what Paul was speaking about here in chapter 11. When Paul speaks of discerning the body, he is not talking about discerning the bread. He's not talking about discerning something connected to the bread and the cup. When he says we need to discern the body, he means that we need to recognize the people, the people of Jesus, the people who are the one body of Jesus in the world. Paul is warning them strongly about their unchristian behavior at their feasts and at the Lord's Supper. And he says that destroying the unity of the Lord's body will result in judgment. Now, Paul is not saying necessarily that these people will lose their eternal salvation. In fact, he says that they're being chastened by God precisely because God does not want them to be condemned along with the world. But listen, he does say that the people who were destroying the unity of the church at Corinth were being chastened. Now, this is a very sober word, church, I know. But Paul says that many in Corinth had become sick, had become weak. And he says that many even fell asleep, which means that they died. This tells us that we receive communion in an unworthy manner when we fail to discern that our brothers and sisters are the beloved of Jesus. To avoid this, Paul says we must judge ourselves. We need to look within our hearts and see if perhaps we are destroying the unity of the body of Christ. If we are, then Paul tells us in church, these are some of the most sober words in the entire New Testament. If we are destroying the unity of the body of Christ, then Paul tells us that we ourselves are guilty of the body and blood of Christ. If we betray our brothers, and you notice that Paul made a point of mentioning on the night he was betrayed. He makes a point of mentioning the word betrayal. He wants us to know that if we betray our brothers, then we are like the one who betrayed Christ. If we hate our brother, then we truly do not love God, as the Bible tells us elsewhere. So if we wish to receive the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner, then we need to discern and remember our brothers. And we also need to discern ourselves. Remember to examine yourself. Remember to commit yourself to maintain, the Bible says, to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And if you've spoken against your brothers and sisters, or if you've hurt someone in the body of Christ in another way, do what you can to make it right. The Bible says, as much as lies within you, as much as is your part to do, be at peace with all men. And I can assure you on the authority of God's word that there is grace available for you. And don't stay away from his table today, which we're going to celebrate. Don't stay away from his table out of condemnation. In a few moments, we'll have an opportunity to pray into these issues so we can all approach the table of Jesus this morning with confidence and we can approach it with joy in our hearts. It can be a time for all of us to receive fresh grace from him. Remember your brothers, remember to examine yourself. And if we want to be worthy guests at Jesus' table, there's a third thing to remember, and it's this. Remember to focus on Jesus. Remember to focus on Jesus. In verse 23, Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, for this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus said, This is how you should remember me. 
Paul rebuked the believers at Corinth very strongly, calling them to remember Jesus, and he pulled their focus back on what Jesus was willing to suffer for you and me. This is Jesus' message to us at his table. Remember that my body was broken. Remember that my blood was spilled. As you come to his table this morning, remember his sufferings. Be amazed. Be astonished. Church, I hope you have not lost your amazement over the fact that God would allow his son to die for you. And not just die for us, but to die for us in such a manner. Marvel. Do we still, I hope, I hope we do still marvel at his amazing love. You remember the old hymn, it says, amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? The selfish Corinthians made it a show. They made it all about them. But Paul said, you want me to praise you? I can't praise your behavior because Jesus said that this meal was about remembering him. And you've forgotten, Corinthians, who this is supposed to be about. I'm not going to belabor this point of my message because I think that this is the part that we mostly do understand and focus on. But church, my prayer is that we will never cease to be amazed at what Jesus was willing to do. For you and me. Somebody ought to praise the Lord for that. Amen. As we think about the sufferings of Jesus for us, it really leads us quite naturally into the final thing we need to remember. If we want to celebrate the Lord's Supper the way that Jesus intended with gladness and joy in our hearts, if we want to be a good guest at Jesus' table, then what we need to remember is this. We need to remember the gospel. Remember the gospel. This is the heart of Paul's argument against people who were perverting the Lord's Supper. In verse 26, we read this. Paul says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Everybody say that word. Say proclaim. <laughs> Paul says, when you do this, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Worship team, you can come back. Please help me if you would. Church, we should be amazed at his suffering. But I want you to know this. There is more than sorrow in the cross. I'm not sure you got that. We should be amazed at his suffering. But you know there is something more than sorrow in Jesus' cross. Church, we can weep when we consider what happened on the cross, but we can rejoice when we begin to think about the why of what happened at the cross. Jesus suffered, he said, to make a new covenant, a new arrangement between God and man, one that included you and me. The Bible tells us that once we were not a people, but now we are, who knows, now we are the people of God. Jesus said he came to give his life as a ransom for many. And the purpose of his, suffer, of his supper is to proclaim that death, is to proclaim the power of the ransom of Jesus' blood. Praise the Lord. And whenever we do that, whenever we announce and declare the death of Jesus, there can be a release of life and the people of God can receive new life from him. Paul says that the Lord's Supper is a proclamation of the death of Christ. And this releases life to me, church. Get this, because when death was announced for Jesus, it meant that life was announced for me. That's why we want to announce his death. That's why proclaiming his death, Paul says, it's the heart of it. It's the very goal of the supper. The goal is not like the Corinthians to act out of strife by dividing the body. It's not to seek our own glory by boasting or showing off over those who are poor. No, the goal of the supper is to announce the death of the one who became a servant so that you could become a king. A king. 
Is the Lord's Supper a sacrifice for sins? No. If you're in Jesus, your sins have already been washed away. The Lord's Supper is not a sacrifice. It is a feast. It is a feast that proclaims the power of Jesus' death to set you free. It speaks to the saints, and it reminds us that salvation has come. It reminds me that I, who have no right to God's presence, now have a share in his holy covenant. Jesus' death speaks to sinners, and it tells them that the doorway is now open, and it is time to come home to God, and you can find a welcome at his throne. The death of Jesus speaks to the satanic princes, and it tells them that they failed. It tells them that the prince of life destroyed them by his death. Church, listen to me, and I hope you get this in your spirit today. Jesus' death was the death of death. Jesus said, amen. Jesus said, I am he that was dead, and behold, I am alive, and I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of hell and of death. And whenever we eat his supper, we are proclaiming, Paul says, that good news. We are announcing the power of Jesus' death. Hallelujah. And like the Corinthians before us, let's remember that this supper is a feast that declares our unity to the world because all of us will eat of the one loaf together, the same bread, because we're one body in him. Church, I guarantee you, there's not too many other places in this area that look like this room this morning that have this many languages and this many colors and this many backgrounds and this many different kinds of places stamped in their passports. Amen. But it's because we know that whatever we look like, sound like, wherever we come from, we've been made one in him. And this meal tells the world that we are the same because of something greater, of someone greater. It's a feast that announces the truth that we are all in need of grace and that we all stand on an equal footing before him. It's a feast that Paul says keeps reminding us to take more grace, to take more strength from Jesus, he says, until he comes again. Because until that day comes, until Jesus returns, you've probably figured this out already, but you haven't arrived yet. And until Jesus returns, we still need his grace. So we're going to celebrate this and use this as a time to keep receiving grace from him until he returns. Today, today we're going to examine ourselves and we're going to commit ourselves afresh in our spirits to walk in unity and to care for the poor and to care for each other. Today, we're going to remember Jesus' love upon his cross. Today, we're going to eat the bread and drink the cup and we're going to proclaim the death of Jesus and proclaim its power. Today, we're going to make an announcement together about the power of Jesus Christ. Come on, stand to your feet and give Jesus a great praise today.